Hello. Um, I'm Sahel Malik from um, I'm teaching at Goldsmiths on the MFA. Uh, I'll set my clock, so uh, I should speak for about 20 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to, this talk is going to take a very different um, approach and speak about very different things. Essentially, it's a, it's a consideration of the art market as it stands now and what that means for uh, what art is, art production and art circulation. So I'm going to describe some impending changes uh, to the art market and the reasons for it, and uh, then suggest complications in how to formulate a response to these changes. That's going to be kind of a, a very minor point at the end. Uh, let's start with the recent worry expressed by the New York gallerist Gavin Brown uh, on the changing conditions and fate of mid-level galleries like his, um, which were established in the mid, mid to late 1990s. Gavin Brown says this. Half the planet's wealth will be in the hands of the richest 0.1% within 30 years, impoverishing not only the middle, but also the upper middle classes. Forget about what that means for middle class galleries. What does it mean for artists? For the lucky ones who fall into the spotlight of this extreme market, there are enormous returns. The model of gallery we have grown up with, like his one, uh, but not just his, of course, it's an international phenomenon. Uh, the model of the gallery we have grown up with is probably over. The large galleries are adapting and responding in an organic way to the expansion of the market. As to the success of that current mid-level gallery, uh, that current mid-level group of galleries, whom I emerged alongside Gavin Brown, I am not sure our success is yet proved or certain. I hear and speak with my friends about the death of the middle. Uh, you can hear the kind of the collapse of the middle classes across um, uh, neoliberal economies uh, echoed uh, and taking place in the gallery circuit here. I hear and speak with my friends about the death of the middle, and I'm beginning to feel it is actually happening. Art, of course, will never go away, but it will be interesting to see what form it will take, alive or dead, in a way of these, uh, in any of these new titanic emporiums like Gagosia and House of Rebirth and so on and so forth. Uh, so, what form will it take in 30 years' time? How long till art is only purely a stand in for the only entity that will matter, capital? Okay, this is from Gavin Brown, who's not, um, as far as I'm aware, a hugely informed economist or political scientist. Uh, this is from summer 2015. Now, brown speculations and worries capture these are these are I think familiar and common common concerns now uh, about the socioeconomic impact of neoliberalism over the past 30 years. Uh, and I'll describe in a, in a in a few moments what neoliberalism is uh, briefly. Brown speculations and worries capture the key issues of of the talk I'm going to present that the art market the art market is now not only a trading mechanism for art, but also the leading shaper of what counts as art, which is what Brown foresees. Um, but also, in addition to that, it's also how art gains significance. Okay? So art uh, is, of course, the trading me the market is the trading mechanism. It shapes what counts as art by the selection pressures within the art, within the art market and the, the concomitant sort of advertising uh, of the art market in magazines like Freeze and Art Forum. Um, but also the art market is how art gains significance, and this, I think, has enormous impact given the changes to the market that Brown speaks about. Um, so the art market, uh, and this is the thesis of my talk, the art market is that the market, the art market is now or will soon be a maker of art, an art maker, as great, if not greater, than other more traditional cultural forces. Right? Uh, and, of course, the traditional cultural uh, conditions for art making have been things like nationhood, ethnicity, uh, shared conventions, subjectivity, and so on. Uh, and my claim is that these are subordinate, or these, if they're not now, they soon will be subordinate, or simply uh, minor factors in the primary maker of art, which will be the art market. But it's also that the art market itself is changing shape. Okay, so in Brown's words, what will happen is increasingly that art will be purely a stand-in for capital. Um, and so what I want to do in the presentation is identify seven current and foreseeable developments in global capital flows and the consequences uh, to look at specific changes in the art market. And I think these changes are happening now or will soon happen. Um, and as I've said, and to emphasize, this is, this is a change not just in what art is made and exhibited, um, uh, 
but also how art is made and exhibited. Okay? So it's not just like the product and its circulation, but the very conditions for there to be art at all. And again, a proviso, uh, I'm talking about contemporary art specifically, uh, which is uh, what, what contemporary art is, what it is, what its contents claims are, like the content and the concerns of the art, which are the kind of things we talk about in art school principally, um, but also the system of production and circulation, which are kind of things that curators talk about principally. Um, in other words, I'm talking about the contemporary art world. Okay. So it's, this isn't a general discussion of all art ever. Uh, this isn't like a generality about art. It's specifically about what art is in the contemporary art system, which is the kind of art that gets um, made here and supported here as well as at the other leading art schools in London. And the leading art schools because they do contemporary art. Okay. Uh, so the first, the first change in the art market is the emergence of new, new global markets. From brick, from the brick block, Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, China, the emergence of that block in the last 10 to 15 years uh, as key economic players and the likely emergence from what's called the Mint Block, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey, uh, which, are, which will emerge, or would, were expected to emerge, over the next 10, 10 to 20 years, um, not to mention an increase in cultural funds and foundations in the Gulf area, as well as in the ASEAN region in, in East Asia. Uh, there's, a, there's a major change in uh, n new economies, new, new areas of, of uh, significant wealth for elites, uh, this money is entering the art system, already has, and will continue to do so. So the total volume of money uh, in the art system increases because of new sources, new, new uh, revenues, um, new income streams, uh, and new demands and directions. This will generate new demands and directions on exhibition, collection, and circulation mechanisms. So the kind of political geography of art, which, which has been predominantly centered in Western Europe, and the United States uh, will change dramatically um, in, in the coming area, in the coming era, because these new areas are the new sources of funding. You can see this happening already with the Gulf very clearly. Uh, the second change is changes on, on offshore tax avoidance. So uh, what's happening now is that there's uh, international regulatory pressure on offshore tax havens. So if you don't know, uh, if you're very rich, you don't want your money to be taxed because that, that diminishes your wealth. You park it outside of the national jurisdiction in which you live uh, in special, specially constructed um, tax avoidance mechanisms, essentially. These are, these are legal, or they were more legal than they are now. The United States is putting heavy pressure on these tax avoidance mechanisms, uh, partly through Obama's kind of very soft left um, uh, policies, but also I think uh, a, 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 an increased worry about money laundering and um, uh, kind of links to narco terror networks. Um, so under under these pressures, corporations and what are called high net worth individuals uh, quasi legally stash they they have quasi legally stashed money and assets out of sight from domestic tax authorities. But what the pressures the the, the new um, governmental pressures mean is that um, these, these are less appealing as places to stash your wealth. Um, and what happens then is that the wealth is being transferred to what are called private luxury assets, including art, uh, which becomes a better channel for um, holding, holding your, uh, your uh, not your income, your, your capital from the tax collector, okay, from the state. This is a kind of flight to safety. Uh, and it's another way in which, as money goes from the offshore tax base to private assets, which include art, uh, and art's very good for this, this uh, changing economy because there's a lot of it, and people can make money currently. It's a, it's a lively economy, um, uh, uh, and it, it's kind of, um, it, it expands and contracts as the, as the demand uh, expands and contracts. If you're dealing with, um, fine wines or yachts, there's only so many of them available, right? With the art market, it comes and goes. There's an oh, abundance of supply of artists, uh, a very strong interest from the middle sector, the commercial sector, um, to, to trade it, because there's money to be made there, um, which means that 
uh, it's actually a very good liquid or elastic sector for um, for for income flows for uh, for this kind of um, holding pattern, if you want. So this this flight to safety is another channel for increasing the total. What will happen, of course, is that, and it started to happen already, uh, uh, is that the total amount of money, the volume of money in the art system, is going to increase markedly. Uh, not because people are particularly interested in art, but that they become interested in art as a way, as a, as a as a security, as a security box, essentially, a tax-free security box. Okay, um, so art will then become a demand-led sector. The demand from the what will then be called a collector or a asset base. Um, in and it's an interesting one in this in this uh, mechanism because it's still currently unregulated. And yet, it's a sanctioned market. Okay, so it's not like dodgy, dodgy drug money, which is unregulated but unsanctioned as well. Right? The art market is unregulated. I think it's the only remaining wholly unregulated sector. Um, but it's also ex perfectly acceptable. It's acceptable that it's unregulated, unlike every other market. Um, so it makes it very good for tax avoidance because you don't have to declare what you've bought. Right? Um, this is a this this move from offshore tax avoidance to um, to art field is a point I owe to Nathan Newman, who was involved in this project offshoreart.co, um, which was set up by uh, Kathleen Detzig, Robin Lynch, and uh, RCA design student Debbie Ding. Um, you can find more information. There's some there's some videos of the conferences they had uh, at this website. So that's that's two. The third is the consolidation and growth of art as what's called an alternative asset class. And here, uh, what's happening is that um, uh, the, the art becomes a channel for monetary accumulation over a period of time. Okay? This is uh, playing off the risks in the standard commercial markets, the, the stock exchange, finance markets, and so on, against other markets as a way of spreading your bets and distributing risk. Okay. The expectation is the art market moves in different ways to, say, the stock market. It moves in different ways to derivatives markets, uh, which means that if one of them folds or kind of you, you make losses on one, that those losses are kind of offset by continued growth in another market. Here, the interest in art as a thriving market, as a thriving financial and growing market, um, is, is only a way of distributing risk for an investor. The investor doesn't care about art. Um, so the alternative asset class is a, is a sector in which art is understood as a risk-based return established by financial investment firms. It's not, it's not an interest generated from within the art field. Art in this, con in this configuration is no different to any other market uh, since its prices are, of course, moving in a risky way, which is good, in fact, for the operation of a distributed portfolio of, of investments. Um, but the point of these asset classes, these alternative asset classes, as I've said, is that the particularities of its markets and pricing trajectories allow for a diversification of risk and income streams away from regular commercial markets. Okay, so it's the difference of the art market from regular markets that makes it attractive as a kind of offsetting mechanism from risks in commercial markets. So the growth of the contemporary art market or art markets since 2008 makes sense. Okay, 2008. A uh, big collapse in standard commercial markets, capital markets. Uh, investors are looking to uh, get get some security at a time when there's maximum fragility in standard commercial markets. Everyone pours their money, not everyone. There's a lot of money being poured into the art market. The market inflates, and that's great because if you do a resale, you've you've kind of got some returns when everything else is going down. Okay, and very very fragile. This, this diversification of, of capital, of investment, has become increasingly attractive, as I've said, both um, in the 2008 financial crash, but since then, because global growth has been sluggish. Okay? So growth is about between 0 and 3%, 3% if you're doing really, really well. China is about, has been at 7 but is now kind of on the downward slope. Um, returns in the art market can be very high if you invest in certain art markets, and I'll speak about that in a minute. What happens then is that there's an increased interest in art as an alternative asset class, alternative to standard commercial markets. Um, but um, 
this impacts the current organization of the art field in three ways, in three main ways. And the last of this will lead to the fourth main point I want to make. So the first way it impacts on the art market is it introduces vastly larger amounts of money in the art market than has been the case because the people who are investing in it or what's investing in the art market aren't individuals building collections, they're corporations and investment houses who have billions, billions and billions to invest. They're, inv they're not investing billions in the art market because one, it will throw the market. Secondly, they're not entirely sure about it. Thirdly, they don't understand how it works because it's not regulated. All right? So the money coming in is still being kept at fairly low levels, but the net result is an increase of money into the art market, which just changes, changes what the art market is. Um, the other point is that unlike a collector, the investment company or the corporation is investing not on the basis of their personal interests. Right? So what's being collected doesn't have to reflect a taste of the collector or a specific kind of cultural project. Um, it's not that model. It's simply like, what returns can I gain from an investment in art? The second way, um, the second way uh, there's going to be a change in the art market, and it's somewhat in contradiction to the points about the art market being unregulated, is that um, as, a, as a formal financial development, because it's being done by corporations who have to report their investments to tax authorities and the state, and to, and to their shareholders. Um, as a formal financial investment, what's going to be needed is a regulatory framework for the art market. Right? And this is going to completely transform how art operates. Okay? The current art market operates on a kind of shady wheeling and dealing cartel structure. Uh, secret deals, handshakes, nods and winks, dinners. Um, that, that can't continue in a, regulatory, in a tightly regulated framework. And you need a regulatory framework because you need to understand if you're an investment corporation or an investment company, how the market works, that it's working well as a market, that there isn't systemic and endemic corruption, which there is in the current art market, and that investors aren't simply being taken for a ride by their investments or through their investments. So what will change is the standard opaque cartel-like operational mode of the art market as we've known it and as still predominantly exists, um, will, will be replaced, um, sorry, the, the cartel-like operation since the emergence of uh, the primary market of the gallery dealer circuit and the exhibitions that they support um, and which now sort of shape our international art culture uh, in Western modernity will change over to something more like a regular, a regular market. Okay? In some ways, this development uh, it's this development and not the concentration of wealth that Gavin Brown is identifying. It's this development towards regulatory markets, which is going to be the, which is the greatest existential threat to the existing formation of the art markets and its habitus. Right? The concentration of wealth, in a way, uh, continues a trajectory that's in place. If, if there's regulation within the art market, we're in a wholly new situation. Uh, so that's number three. Number four. Um, art as an asset class presumes that any investment in art will yield returns at a future point. Right? That's why you invest in it, because you're going to get uh, an, increase, uh, an increase in the value or increase in the price, which you can then cash out and get a profit from it. Um, so what you need are sales, obviously. And this, in turn, requires a resale market. You, you, if you don't have a strong resale market, you can't. The sales aren't guaranteed. It's not guaranteed that there will be sales, uh, in which case the, the investment moment of art uh, isn't secure. Right? So the market is actually a, a fragile one, and it has been historically. And in a way, that's what's been al that's what's allowed it to, uh, and also been promoted by the kind of uh, cartel structure of the art field. So we need a what's going to be needed is a resale market that can accommodate all the work that is being sold, as well as general expectation of increasing prices over time and for resale. Okay? Obviously, goods that depreciate in price over time without use um, uh, or earnings or revenues or something like this make for a very bad market. What's needed for, uh, for goods which can't be used, from which you can't generate earnings um, uh, through, through use, like a car or a computer or something like this, uh, you need a market that, 
the, the asset will generally increase over time because that's the only way you're going to get any earnings from it. Art is that kind of good. So what's, what's needed is a market which is generally directed towards the growth of prices. Okay. So the interest in art as an investment for either for flipping, for financial returns, or as a tax avoidance mechanism requires a strong and stable resale market, which it isn't at the moment. And the fewer questions that are asked in this resale market, the better. Bigger is better because the transactional good has to be available. A bigger market is a better market because the transactional good, the artwork, has to be available to as many possible buyers as, po as, many buyers as possible in order to convert the good into an earning stream. Okay? If you have very few buyers for an artwork, which is kind of the situation now, um, th there aren't many buyers. So, so simply, there's, you, you, the, the market kind of shrinks in its sort of transactional speed. Um, so what's needed is the expansion of the number of buyers, but you only have an expansion of the number of buyers if you loosen the cartel structure of the art field. Okay? And also if the resale, if the resale uh, moment is kind of more strongly and clearly established. Uh, now, if, if, if you have a strong and stable resale market, you countermand the closed shop practices of the primary market, which is the model that we still exist with, the gallery dealer circuit. Um, and I guess, I guess in a way what's happening now in East and South Asia where art is going directly to secondary market for sale through auctions without the primary market moment uh, is a kind of uh, an indicator of where things are going. Uh, the fifth transformation um, is that what is transformative in the restructuring of the secondary market geared up for more resales has become more like shops essentially, right? Uh, and you can sort of see this already within like the the Christmas moment in art galleries, where sort of there's there's a, usually a group show of small works, uh, which is kind of ready for sale. And obviously, like the freeze phenomena is a kind of hybrid between the the cartel structure of the art field and this kind of shop like shop like moment, uh, and the general growth of art fairs is a way of generating a kind of uh, stronger and more stable resale uh, circuit. What's transformative in the restructuring of the secondary market geared up for more resales uh, with regard to art in particular is that under the current logics, what is more likely to sell again, because what we're interested in is the resale of a work which gains in price. Okay? And the only way you could guarantee that is what's more likely to sell again is art that is currently considered to be important work. Art that's not considered to be important work, of course, won't increase in price because who's interested in it? The question is, how do we establish important work? Right? You can't do it on the basis of earnings, likely revenue, uh, and other kind of utilitarian interests. Um, so there's a, this, is, this is, I think, the crucial, the crucial moment. The, the, the recognition of art as significant or important uh, relies somewhat on the content claims of the art and how it's received within the art world. Criticism, curating, exhibition, so on and so forth. So artistic significance is the only basis for anticipating the future price of a work, or what is, what is, what's called its value. Okay, we already see this when prices, when artwork goes for sale at auctions and it goes for a high price, it's somehow more significant than other works. It's not understood simply to be a reflection of uh, whichever dealer buying their work back to put an indicator within the market of what will, what's going to happen to the other sales outside of the auction mechanism. It's understood to be like artists are more significant because they sell for higher prices. Like Richter is an important artist for us, partly because of like content claims around the work, which in some ways are not that different to many other artists, but because the price is very, very high. And here there's, a, I think, an initial sense in which the distinction between market structures, um, the, the, the restructuring of markets on the one hand, and on the other hand, questions of significance, or as I said, the quality of art on the other hand, cannot be rigorously distinguished. Okay? So the standard, the standard mechanism or the standard sort of uh, premise of discussion in art, which is you've got quality of art on the one hand, which is simply about what the artwork is and what content and meaning we can extract from it and how it circulates 
within the art system. And on the other hand, you have something called price, which has nothing to do with the first thing. Um, that's gone, and it's going quickly now. The art market will concentrate more and more on art that is deemed to be significant. As Brown's, Gavin Brown's remarks uh, demonstrate, the overall expansion in size and price level, um, uh, this is the point I'm just making. The overall um, expansion in size and price level in the art system, and in contemporary art in particular, will not then lift all boats. But it's going to be channeled more and more towards art that is likely to guarantee returns on resale, quality work. So with regard to art, and here is something specific about the art market, I think. Quality is another name for this consolidation of market power and stabilization effects around this or that artwork. Okay? It's just a way of guaranteeing prices. What it indexes is that the art market and all will be displayed in leading institutions and publicity mechanisms like Freeze and Art Forum uh, will become increasingly concentrated around an epicenter with rapidly increasing prices, the blue chip sector, a sector that tries to enter into this, into this core, uh, this core concentration of power and money, art power we could call it, and then there's going to be the rest. And what we return to or what we then uh, establish or what gets established in a very powerful way is the core margins model. The sixth moment is that the, there will be new secondary market structures uh, coupled with the mobilization of hype that takes the artwork as a channel for very quick resale and profit making. Okay. So the current model of flipping, uh, if you don't know what flipping is, an established collector or dealer type figure um, buys work from a gallery or indirectly from an artist uh, and pumps up its importance via social media. Now, it works partly by the act of acquiring it, so if like an important, significant a person who's held to be important, significant, buys the artwork, it already increases in value because they've purchased it. Okay, um, it's like a it's like a low level quotidian way in which museums give significance to work. The significance is partly the reputation of the person's buying it, but also an increase in the that directly results in an increase in price. Or it's rather it's a price setting mechanism. Okay, so acquisition is a price setting mechanism uh, in this model. What then happens is a very quick resale to someone in the network, the social media network, without permission or discussion with the initial gallery if there is one, or even with the artist. Okay? So all the kind of carefulness and sort of like pussyfooting that goes on to secure uh, artists' careers through the primary market sector collapses in the name, uh, through a very kind of quick turnover of the artwork as a commodity for, for resale. That's flipping. Uh, so the artwork is then taken a commodity like any other. It may as well be a house or a car or something else. But apart from it doesn't have use, so its value doesn't depreciate through use. Um, but it's, a, it's one that gains in price rather than depreciates from acquisition. And the current, current bogeyman for this is Stefan Simkovitz, uh, who operates out of uh, I think New York and Los Angeles. Um, but his aggressive model of flipping, you can join his Instagram if you really want to see some stuff. Um, his very aggressive model of flipping is clearly just an early stage of development of a broader reorganization expansion of the art market, both in its acquisition base, which are formerly known as collectors, but they're not only collectors, they're just flippers, and also through the resale channels. Okay? So this is like a major transformation, I think, in the art field. Uh, in a way, it sort of counters some of the concentration of power um, that I was describing in the fifth point. So the seventh and last point I want to make, because uh, we're speaking, I'm speaking, we're talking at a leading art school, which is itself undergoing rapid transition. Uh, and I teach another one, which is somewhat more slowly going through rapid transition, uh, like a medium paced transition, I guess. So if the past 20 or 30 years have seen the MFA or the equivalent take a role as a kind of entryway or a gatekeeper into a quasi-professional art circuit, then the changes in higher education implemented in the UK and the US, especially to higher education over the past 20 years, uh, and especially in the UK over the past five years, uh, also contribute to this market making of art. And they do so because, as we know, the withdrawal of public funds uh, for M-level education, together with the increased fees, has three consequences. Firstly, very high debt levels for those who choose to go into M-level education, higher than undergraduates, um, which means that if you want to enter the professional field through MFAs or MAs, 
uh, you have to become more indebted. You know, this is like, it, it's, it's starting to get quite bad here, but it's nowhere near as bad as in the States. These debts are furthermore extremely unlikely to be acquitted, even over the long term, uh, given, and they're unlikely to be acquitted because generally artists uh, earn very low levels of income. Okay? Partly because they want to have jobs which allows them to continue with their art practices, so the part-time, partial, precarious work. The second way in which uh, the change in higher education affects the art field is that repayment of debt drains and draws back future disposable incomes, because you've got to pay back your debt, which means you have less disposable income, which means that post-college studio rental uh, at increasing at prices that are themselves increasing for rental becomes less and less available. Okay? So there's kind of like a knock-on effect of entering the art market with a lot of debt, which is actually can't afford the studio that you might want in order to kind of continue your practice afterwards, because you have the debt that made you think that you could get to a studio as a postmaster student. Uh, and this has immediate consequences, the absence or the, 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 um, the shrinking back of, of available studio space, of course, has consequences for what art gets made, spatially and in terms of time, um, but also how much time there is to make it. So what artist changes because of this, this increased debt burden on students. Uh, and the third point um, is that art school at advanced level is available only to those who can now afford it anyway, if they're not taking on huge debts. Okay? Those who have historical privilege and those whose families and supporters do well from the general redistribution of wealth and income in neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is just this concentration of wealth to fewer and fewer, the 1%. It's actually 0.01%. That's the, that's the hardcore truth of neoliberalism. The 1% just makes for a tidy slogan for opponents. So artists are increasingly drawn from smaller socioeconomic pool uh, of those who are in a position to collect it too, right? the, the elites. Art for the rich, by the rich. I know this point to Millie Brown, a doctoral student at Goldsmiths, who makes it in a much more subtle and nuanced way. I'm being fairly blunt. So, just to conclude, for all of the growth of the art market over the last 15 years and its transformations, uh, the transformation of the culture of art, I think today we're actually at the beginning uh, of a new art economy. All right, what we've seen over the last 15, 20 years are uh, just like skirmishes, essentially. We're, we're going to enter a whole new phase. We're just going to see a massively increased art market, uh, greater concentration of power in art and money in art, and, and uh, a, quite a large reorganization of the art field. We can maybe take that up in the questions. So the, the, the concentration of wealth that Gavin Brown highlights in the quote I started with is just one effect. Uh, what Brown doesn't speak about is how art will change itself. He says art will continue, of course. It may, but it's going to be, I think, a different art that becomes visible and prominent and that we understand to be contemporary art. As elsewhere, in the broader economies of neoliberalism, the processes of power concentration will increase. So the future of art, um, the future of art being established today is directed to and for the point, the 0 0.01%. Okay? To be clear, not just the 0.01% of those with capital, but also the 0.01% of art. This elitism, and we're entering a period of increased elitism in the art field, uh, is historically familiar in terms of a received notion of the artist's genius, okay, the one who's exceptional to all others, a 0.01% on the basis of some, some obscure notion of talent or creativity. But whereas the exceptionality of the genius was determined by some feature, some subjective feature uh, associated with the art, what we now see is that exceptionality is only going to be constituted by market status. Right? So the genius will be replaced by uh, the Smithian hand of the market. Thank you.